Excelsior True Believers, you're listening to That Gets My Goat. And now, spider friends, here's your host, Big Outfield and Rich Ankle Fuck. Rich, Rich Outfield and Big Anklevich. All right. True Believers. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of That Gets My Goat. I am Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. And it seems like it's been a long time since we've done this. Yeah, it does kind of feel like it's been a while, huh? Maybe it always feels like it's been a while, because we used to do this every week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it used to be every uh, every week, and three or four uh, recordings every week as well, so... I think we've just gotten old. Can't keep that stamina going. You know, there are other people who podcast, and they're never in the same room. It's always, they're, they're many states away or many, many miles apart. It's just the way that they do it. And I think that because you and I started it with us in the room looking at each other, it's always been really hard to do it a different way. Yeah, it is kind of weird. And we've done a few Skype podcast before I ever moved away. But yeah, for some reason now that I've moved away, it feels uh, it's it's harder. I, I Maybe it's just because we don't have the time where we get together and BS for a lot of a lot of time because it seems like a lot of our ideas came from some of that kind of stuff where we were just sitting there at Wendy's or whatever and talking about crap and then we'd be like, oh, we should do a show about this. And then we would. Well, sure. Uh, we do have something to talk about this time around though. Well, I guess that's the same as every time around, now that I think about it, but... <laughs> shoot, the last time we, we uh, put out an episode, it was about one of the... Uh, what was it? The Star Wars movie, right? I, I think that was the last one we did. Uh... And now it's time for another uh, movie podcast. For those of you who dig on that, hopefully that's a lot of you, all of you, most of you. We're going to talk about uh, the most recent release from Marvel Studios. The Black Panther. Is it The Black Panther or just Black Panther? I think it's just Black Panther, right? Right, there's no the. Okay. Did they refer to him as The Black Panther in the movie? It seems like they might have. Yeah, I think they said that several times. Like, you're going to get the essence of The Black Panther and stuff like that. Anyways, Black Panther came out this week. We're talking about it. So get ready. Because this ain't funny. My name is Mike D, and I'm about to get money. Sorry. A little Paul Revere for you. Is it, wait, is that the wiffle ball bat quote? <laughs> it's the same song, yeah. It's not the same quote, but uh, yeah. Okay. It's MCA who did it like this and did it like that. <laughs> did it with the wiffle ball bat. That, that probably puts me at a disadvantage for talking about Black Panther, because when it comes down to it, that's about the extent of knowledge of rap music that I have. Uh, once we got out of, like, once we got past about 94, once we made it to Tupac and Biggie, I was already gone. I was already completely divorced from rap music. I don't know what has happened since then, and that was, what, at least, like, 22, 23 years ago <laughs> that those guys came on the scene? Fresh Prince... Oh, I totally know Fresh Prince's stuff. LL Cool J? Oh, I'm down with LL Cool J. <laughs> what were those guys? Why can't I think of their names? So were the two kids that wore their clothes backwards or inside out? Backwards. Was it Criss Cross? That's it. Oh, yeah. I, I, I'm i down with Criss Cross big time. But, yeah, apparently uh, there's a lot of... Uh, like, I, I actually went looking for the soundtrack... The, wh- Normally, when a movie comes out and I search for the soundtrack, I get the movie score that I can listen to, you know. And at one time, I think, was it Doctor Strange? When I managed to get the score before the film came out and I listened to it a bunch of times before the film came out so that I could have that kind of experience of being familiar with the movie or with the music going into the movie. So I thought I'd try that again with Black Panther. And so I searched for it. All I could find was... Uh, was the, the the songs inspired by the movie Black Panther? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's what it was, and it was all 
like that Kendrick Lamar stuff. Yeah, Kendrick Lamar, who I've never heard. I, I suppose I probably have now heard his music, but before going to see this movie, I had not. So yeah, I mean, this is a movie that's that's got a lot of rap influence, I guess, and I'm, yeah, at a disadvantage because I fell away from that years and years ago, sadly. Now you are totally down with hip hop and rap, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in fact, the, the Kendrick <laughs> Lamar song that they had in the trailer for Black Panther, um, pretty much guaranteed I was not gonna see the movie. And, and yeah, that's that's something that we need to get out of the way right here, right right now. Um, that there's a, a film reviewer that I've just got, gotten so sick of his reviews because he always has to make some kind of apology of why he shouldn't be allowed to review a movie like this, why he shouldn't be allowed to review a movie with a gay protagonist or a female protagonist or a black protagonist. And it's just, it's gotten so old to hear him say this. It's like, look, it's your job to review movies. And if a <laughs> filmmaker is good, then you'll be able to appreciate the story that he told or she told, despite being red, orange, brown, or, or, or green, whatever color or, and race and, and ethnicity and, and, and sexual orientation and religion you happen to be. Yeah. I, I don't feel like... I have to apologize for my species at all because I paid for the movie ticket. I paid to see the movie <laughs> and that alone qualifies me to talk about it with authority. And, and maybe that's an unpopular next, next thing you know, that guy's going to say, I, I'm not qualified because this one has a human protagonist and uh, I'm, I'm just not qualified. Yeah. Sorry, go on. It, it's just, it, I've heard him say it so many times that it started to rub off on me a little bit. And when the ad campaign was going for Black Panther, in the back of my mind, I was just like, gosh, maybe maybe this one's not for me. Maybe, maybe I should skip this one. Because what if I don't like it? And people say, well, you don't like it because you're a racist prick. I just, yeah, I don't. Yeah, one of those things wouldn't be true. <clears throat> <laughs> and it's it's funny because I went and saw it and a movie that you and I saw together back when we were still hanging out, and I wish we had done an episode about, but I was reminded there was that horror movie, it was a year ago now, Get Out, that Jordan Peele directed, and you and I went and saw it, uh -huh. and the subtext of that movie was what it's like to be a, a black man in a white world where... There's always suspicion on you where you're always the other, where you're always marginalized. And despite being a white devil, I went to that movie and it spoke to me. And the main character, Chris, I felt like I was Chris, despite, like I said, being a white, white devil. devil. A, a, a story that's well told can speak across ethnic barriers or across gender barriers or across, you know, sexual orientation barriers. And even if I can't relate to the life experiences of the character on the screen that we're seeing, I can still admire the story being told. I can admire characters that are well-developed. I can admire clever dialogue. I can admire action sequences that work. And so I'm very grateful that I enjoyed black panther and that i went to see it at all because yeah i was dumb to think okay well this movie's not made for me this movie is made for urban youth when i saw the movie i don't know that it was made for urban youth because wakanda doesn't exist it was a superhero film mm -hmm. there is no black panther none of that stuff actually exists so for me to say because my ancestors didn't come from africa that it, it can't speak to me I don't know. That's ludicrous. It 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 was a sci-fi movie, right? Anyway, sorry. I was just talking and talking. Why don't you talk for a minute? <laughs> no, I I know exactly how you feel. I kind of felt a little bit that way too, and I I feel a little, truthfully, afraid in reviewing this film. I'm afraid to say the wrong thing and upset somebody. I know that we have people that listen to our show from all sorts of backgrounds. It's, it's hard to please everybody, for sure. Um, I hope 
that I feel like we can still have something to say. I don't, I don't feel like movie Bob in that I'm, I'm not qualified to talk about stuff just because of this or that. I'm, I'm kind of a, maybe this is gonna get me in trouble, but I'm kind of against the whole collectivism that's going on out there these days. Everybody is kind of arranging themselves into, you know, their groups, their tribes, their teams or whatever. And the, the overarching things that used to connect us all seem to be falling away for these smaller divisions. But in my mind, you know, a person is a person. Every person is a person. And every person, they're, they're not worth something because of what characteristic they were born with or whatever. They're worth something because of what kind of a person they are. You know what I mean? If you're a good person, then you're a good person. Doesn't matter uh, your gender, your orientation, your race, your political affiliation, whatever. And if you're not a good person, then you're not a good person. No matter what your gender, etc. So that's, you know, how I feel about it. And I, I think I'm in the minority these days. It's starting to seem like that's an unpopular opinion these days. And I don't want to get any more political than that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nip it in the bud there and maybe we'll move on to the movie itself. But it's hard to do that with a movie like this because this movie was kind of seen as a touchstone, right? I, I don't know if you got that. Oh, absolutely. Ex- but everybody was saying, hey, this is a big deal because this is a predominantly black movie. You know, every most of the characters in it are black. Um, the director was black, the art director, et cetera, et cetera, down the line of the uh, behind the scenes personnel were also black. So this was important. And, and I kind of bristled at that a little bit because it, it's like when all of a sudden, you know, superhero movies became something that somebody, that the culture in general cares about. You know what I mean? Like before, when you and I were kids, and you know Superman came out and and then Superman 2 came out and then they they kind of sank into obscurity and you didn't get any more superhero movies for a while and then Batman came out and you got a few Batman movies and then, and nobody cared much about them and they were still kind of like oh it's like your dad where he, where he would always say oh those are funny books he's reading his funny books people in general will still oh, that's those are movies for kids a grown man shouldn't be watching a movie like that. And I still hear that, even to this day. I, I heard somebody say that about Black Panther. Uh, you know, a movie that's made for kids. It's surprising that it's getting this kind of traction as a cultural touchstone. It's frustrating when suddenly all these people who have ignored superhero movies for so long want to say that this one is... And I heard it a lot because, you know, I, I work in the news and the news packages would say, it's the first black superhero movie. And I'm just like, what the f- are you talking about? The first black superhero movie? Oh, shoot. How far back do we have to go? I mean, there was Steel in the 90s, played by Shaq. <laughs> there was even Meteor Man. Come on. He was in the 90s too. But, I mean, the, the, the movies that pretty much kicked off this modern superhero genre was Blade. It was played by Wesley Snipes. It was a black superhero. And it's the same thing that happened with Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman came out and they said, oh, it's the first superhero movie with a woman in it. And you're just like, no. I, I mean, I'm pretty sure that one would have to be Supergirl. But there was also Halle Berry's awful Catwoman movie. And, and she clicked two boxes. Right. Why are you people trying to claim that this is the first one? Is it just that you're super lazy so you couldn't bother to even look it up? Because I'm one quick Google would have proved you wrong. <sighs> There's been lots of black superheroes through the ages. And even in Marvel movies, we've had several of them. Maybe they weren't the lead character. Although Blade is the lead character. And he was the first. So they've had that. They've had side characters. Uh, it's not even the first movie that Black Panther was in. Black Panther was in Civil War. So I guess that the milestone that this comes with is the fact that it's 
so many black actors and crew that uh, I guess that's what makes it a touchstone. Or maybe it's the African culture that's so front and center that makes it a thing, that makes it so special to so many people. Well, that was certainly something we hadn't seen before. Mm -hmm. The all, all that, yeah, and, and now, see, I want to tiptoe around it. <laughs> but all that traditional African clothes and music and maybe cultural stuff, but still, it's sci-fi African. Yeah, it wasn't stuff. actual. And it's a it's a it's a fictional country. But but I guess because it was supposed to represent, in the same way that you know, Mister Sulu on Star Trek in 1966 represented all Asians. Right. You know what I mean? It's just like okay, hey, in the future, there's there are going to be Asians, and yeah, I, I, <laughs> Black Panther was it felt different than other movies. It did. And I think that, that that might be part of why people have embraced it so much is because it's like, okay, maybe it's not the first time we've had a black director or a black screenwriter or a black main actor in a, a blockbuster movie, although people are acting like this is the first time. Yeah, they've said exactly that, unfortunately. But it, but it has a different sensibility. It has a different feel. It feels like something that no one has been able to make before. Because it would have cost too much, because it would have been too much of a risk, because the fan base maybe wasn't there, because, I don't know, just the, the stars lined up to make this particular movie. And it's interesting, though, that just last year, not even a year ago, right before you moved away, there was Wonder Woman, and, and that spoke to a lot of people in the exact same way of this is a story that's for us, that means something beyond just being a movie. And if you watch... Both of those movies, they both have sort of a secret society made up of a marginalized people that's hidden away from the rest of the world and then comes to light through the, the course of the film. I don't know if that is by accident that they both have these things in common. You know, Diana is an emissary to the rest of the world, whereas... Most of Black Panther takes place in Wakanda. The, the secret is maintained as a secret. But it's still I still felt like there were things that were the same, that were similar. And yeah, the Wonder Woman didn't have that competition aspect that's from her origin of who would get to be the representative of Themyscira. But if they had had that, then there would be even one more element that those two had in common where, you know, T'Challa is going to be king of Wakanda, but who wants to challenge him? You know, let's have a battle to see who's the strongest and who is worthy to sit on the throne. Anyhow, it just I, I found that kind of strange that it was that there were so many elements in common with Wonder Woman and so many people saying the same things that they said about Wonder Woman back in June or July when that came out, of it, you know, representing a part of the, of society that hadn't had their stories told or hadn't had a hero before or hadn't, I don't know, hadn't had maybe their hero treated with such seriousness before. Maybe that's just the difference. Because nobody is going to look at Halle Berry's Catwoman and say, you know, this is something that's done <laughs> with respect and tact and talent. Well, yeah, I think that's part of the thing. I did see an interview with somebody where they were talking, somebody that worked, I can't remember who it was, to tell you the truth. They were talking about working on the movie. I said, yeah, you know, all this stuff that we're saying here about it being a big touchstone and everything and all that, that's great, but it would all mean nothing if this movie sucked. And I think that that's what really matters here is that this isn't a terrible movie. This isn't going to be something that people look back like Halle Berry's Catwoman. He didn't mention it, but, you know, yeah, nobody, nobody looks back at that and says, oh, yes, women have been represented because it was terrible. And people are happy to just forget it in the same way that nobody wants to remember Spawn. Spawn was a black superhero. And he came out in the 90s, but his movie sucked. And so nobody's going to mention that when they talk about the, you know, the black superheroes. They're just going to conveniently forget about Spawn. And Okay, uh, well then I think you and I are on the same page. 
That, so there are two things that are remarkable about Black Panther, and one of them we've we've gone over, but the other is that it was so well done. It is a solid movie, no matter the color of the the main actor's skin or the the. They worked their butts off to make a movie that doesn't fall apart in the third act as well, too. So there's a a higher touchstone with this. And I'm, again, able to appreciate that as just a person, as an audience member, regardless of my culture, regardless of whether I read Black Panther comic books as a boy or not. There were, there was, there were so many elements of the movie that worked. And part of it is, yes, they've created a new world, and it might as well be an alien world, a science fiction world that we've not seen before, that didn't feel like something we had seen before, that had its own consistent rules and history, and then a bunch of colorful characters that inhabit that world that we like, that we're interested in, and that we root for. And then, of course, yeah, you have your villain, and we had a compelling villain. You had a bunch of set pieces and action sequences, like the the stuff where they went to South Korea. And there was the casino and, and the, the car chase and all that stuff. That felt like a James Bond movie. <laughs> it you totally I mean? did, yeah. I thought the same thing. And, and also the lead up to that, too, where he comes in and he goes and he talks to his sister. Do you remember what his sister's name was? I can't yeah, remember what it was. Yeah, the sister is... Uh, the sister is Shuri. Shuri, okay. So he's talking to his sister, Shuri, who could have very well been named Q... Because they walked through and she's like, yeah, and here's this special feature. And here, now punch your suit. And okay, now let's see what happens. And, you know, she goes through and demonstrates all the tech for him. Just like uh, the James Bond pre-mission thing. Before then, they get out and they go and they actually have the little James Bond adventure. And it worked. The film was also well-directed. I was worried when I saw the trailer when they revealed that Killmonger also wore a Black Panther costume. I was just like, oh, no, it's going to be one of those where I'm not going to know who's fighting whom. But (laughs) it was directed well enough that you always knew which one was Killmonger, which one was T'Challa. At the very least, they put him in yellow and the other in purple. It it helped. That did help. I don't know. I mean, we're in an era where they could have had just totally crappy fight sequences and special effects that jumped out as special effects and a certain segment of the population would have forgiven all that because of what the movie represents the political aspect of the movie but we don't have to overlook those huge flaws with this one because they worked hard enough like the fight scenes and all that stuff were so well choreographed you always knew what was going on and where somebody was and that's another technical aspect of the movie that somebody got right i don't know i just i i admire all the pieces that came together to make this movie work yeah and if any of those pieces had been gone and if they had you know phoned in a b or c then yeah we would be tap dancing around it right now i would probably be saying oh gosh maybe we should cut this part out but i really didn't like the romance or what you know what i mean (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> just it was so weak. Uh-huh. There wasn't stuff like that. Like the history and, and the and the mystery behind who Killmonger was and all that stuff. I think they were trying to examine, you know, that in a, a society where they hero worship their ancestors, what do you do when you find out that there are skeletons in the closet of your ancestors? And they explored that fully. Mm-hmm. But they had written it so well that you can actually have face-to-face with these dead ancestors and have these conversations and all (laughs) that stuff. It's like, that stuff doesn't write itself. Somebody had to think about that and plan that stuff out. And the scene at the very, very beginning where it's just like, okay, who challenges, you know, his claim on the throne? It's like, this clan does not challenge at this time. And then Umbaku comes out and he challenges and all that stuff. Okay, A... It's an action sequence. It gives you a chance for a fight. Right. But B, this was all set up for later in the movie, showing what kind of a, of a leader T'Challa would be, that he defeats this guy, and then he can count on this guy later as an ally. That's something that 
only came to me afterward where I was thinking about the movie and thinking about, well, okay, why did Eric Killmonger fail and T'Challa succeed? Because Killmonger seemed to, for some reason, be a better fighter, a tougher dude. Yet he was one of those guys who burned his bridges wherever he went and made enemies or whatever, and he didn't have a big surrounding of allies and people that he could depend on. And T'Challa did. He had a huge extended group of people, of friends that he had made, of family and all that. You know, it's just like you could have alienated. What's Martin Freeman's character's name? Do you remember? Martin Freeman is... I want to say his name like was Everett Ross. Does that sound right? Uh, yes, I think that's it. You could have alienated Ross, the Everett Ross character, because, you know, he's the outsider and he represents, to all extents and purposes, the man. You know what I mean? The old school establishment. Yet they made an ally of him and gave him something to do narratively and also, you know, another person that you could count on that had certain skill sets that came in handy through the course of the film. I don't know. I just, I felt like there was a a message being put forth of unity, of people needing and depending on one another rather than standing on their own two feet and not needing nobody that resonated in this film. And it's like, wow, that's, it's a message. They didn't hit me over the head with a message, but it's a message that I think all of us need right now in the world. It's like, well done, guys, for choosing that, for choosing to focus on that. Because you and I agreed in Civil War that T'Challa didn't always come off as a likable guy. Yeah. He came off as vain and one of those guys that didn't need anybody else and he was going to do it all himself. And in this movie, they established at the very, very beginning that he has this group of people that he depends on and he could not succeed without you know there's that line that was in the trailer of you know it's like don't freeze and i never freeze and then he freezes and i dug that they didn't show him freeze in the trailer they only included the line i never freeze you know what i mean Uh but when you see him falter and see that he has weaknesses and that he needs other people i don't know that just makes me root for the character makes me like the character makes any preconceptions of well, I didn't particularly like him in Civil War, go away. So again, another accomplishment that these filmmakers made, and, and, and these things don't happen by accident, somebody chose to make that decision to humanize this character so that we would root for him all the more later on. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really impressive. Uh, it's starting to almost feel like a pattern. You know, Marvel has just got... The, there's very few times where they have an actual misfire of a movie where you're just like, uh. You actually made me do this recently where we went through, you had me try and guess the Rotten Tomatoes score for all the movies. <laughs> for all the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies, yeah. Yeah, just one time we were talking on the phone. You're like, oh, I just pulled them all up. Just tell me what they are. And, you know, here's there's this one. What's the score on it? And I was guessing, and I usually was off by... Two. For some reason, I was always off by two. Yeah, you'd say, oh, uh, 89, and I'd say 91. Yeah, somehow you you were always off by two, but you were always almost exactly on two. But there's so few of them where they were really low. I'm trying to remember what all of them were. What was the, the lowest one was what, Thor Dark World? Thor Dark World was, yeah, was the lowest on and the And it was still... In like the 70s, wasn't it? I don't remember. It? I want to say it was like 67, but I don't know. Oh, it's 66. Okay, I was off by one. Or maybe it's gone down. Is it possible it's still moving? <laughs> I don't know. I wonder about that. Yeah, but Thor, I guess Thor the Dark World is the worst that they've had. And I want to say Iron Man 3? Somewhere in the lower end too, right? But lower end means in the 70s, 60s. Thor Dark World is 66. So they've obviously really got this storytelling thing down and they've, they've really figured out how to make a story work, you know? It's, it's interesting because I know very little about Black Panther. He's not one of the 
may, I mean, he's been an Avenger forever, as far as I know, but the main thing that I know about him is the exact thing that they used in this movie where they, you know, have to, that you challenge for the right to be the king. And I saw, I want to say it was an Avengers cartoon episode that was about him in which, uh, what's the guy's name? Umbaku? Umbaku's the man ape. All right, who's known as the man ape, although they shy away from that probably wisely in this movie. Yeah, he challenges and beats Black Panther in the cartoon and becomes the king for a while and remember what all exactly happened in that. But yeah, it's similar to this movie, except for we had Killmonger instead being the, the real bad guy and Mbaku does not. He challenges but does not win. I know that there'll be a Black Panther 2 and I hope to get more in depth of his uh, mythos, whatever you want to call it. I'm assuming there's got to be more to it than just that. Uh, there's got to be a lot of stuff that comes from a character. Because, well, he was created, what, in the 60s, 70s? In the 60s, yeah. So he's been around for a long time. He's got to have a decent amount of stuff that you can explore. It's You know, that's the one thing that felt like a drawback for me and not that it would be a drawback for everybody because you know I'm sure most of the people that went and saw the movie never saw that same episode of the cartoon that I saw and so they did not know about this stuff. I get the feeling there might be a lot of people who are getting introduced to Black Panther and perhaps the Marvel Universe in general for the first time with this film but you know it, it to me it felt like oh it's, it's like Spider-Man and we got to see his origin story, he's bit by the spider, and Uncle Ben gets killed. And we already saw that once, but now we're seeing it again because they've rebooted it. And I'd like to just learn other stuff. Um, and I'm, I look forward to that coming. Although when it comes down to it, I know that Black Panther has been more of an Avenger than a solo character through the years as well. So I don't know how much of his backstory they may get into. I know that he's got a pretty decent part coming up in the, uh, judging by the trailer of Avengers Infinity War. He's got some good lines and I've seen some battles stuff with him along with the rest of the Avengers. So there's that to look forward to. But yeah, uh, I really enjoyed this movie. I thought it was really good and accessible to everybody. You know what I mean? I do, I, and, and I was afraid that it wouldn't be. And, and, you know, that's okay. If the movie is not for me, that's okay. Not, I, I, I know that that's, you know, that's a criticism that people like us get all the time. Not everything has to be for you. And I understand, but at the same time, I bought my ticket with my money. And so the fact that I enjoyed it and that there were things that spoke to me and... I related to despite skin color makes it doubly successful. And I, they had a lot more on the line with a movie like this than a Tyler Perry movie that it's okay if it just focuses on a, a segment of the population. With Black Panther, the fact that my nephews that are as white as the day is long can enjoy the movie and can root for Black Panther... I don't know. That's a success, too. A success that's beyond just they made a movie with an African hero. The fact that they made an accessible, good movie with an African hero is the real accomplishment, I think. And yeah, now I'm a Black Panther fan. And so when they announce a Black Panther 2, I will be excited about it. Um, same as w you and I saw Doctor Strange together and I'd always found Doctor Strange boring and had no interest in Doctor Strange, but it's just like, oh, I can't wait to see another movie with this character. Well done. And, and I just, I, I like that visually it looked like nothing we'd seen before and, uh, they took their time to have motivation for these characters and then to give all these characters from the sister, the love interest, even the mother, the Forrest Whitaker character, all of them had something to do, some reason to be there. 
fleshed out lives that beyond just the screenplay. And that's cool too. I, I, I really liked claw. I really liked what they gave Gollum to do with Ulysses <laughs> claw. It's just the, they had just all sorts of really colorful, interesting characters that came to life when they were on the screen. And so I wouldn't mind seeing the movie again. The previous benchmark was not Wonder Woman. The previous benchmark was The Dark Knight, when everybody was talking about it and it got nominated for Best Picture. And it's like, yeah, okay, this is a comic book movie, but this was a great movie regardless of its origins in comic books. Do you know what I mean? Uh Uh-huh. Where it's just like, okay, as a Batman movie, The Dark Knight is successful. But beyond that, divorced completely from comic books, it is all the more successful. And so that that's the thing with Black Panther. The true accomplishment with Black Panther is that we're always running into people that are saying, oh, there are so many comic book movies and how the they're so juvenile and it's all fanboys and there's a hundred of them released every year. None of that is true, <laughs> but the fact that a movie like Black Panther can come out, maybe that will shut up a couple of those people that are like, well, okay, this one wasn't like all those other cookie cutter superhero films. All right, I'll give you that. And that helps everybody, not just a marginalized per- percentage of the audience. That helps all these films. What do they say? A high tide raises all ships. Uh, yeah. Is that, is that the saying? Did I get yeah, that right? Something like that. I want to say a rising, rising tide. tide. But then lifts you would say, all ships. Maybe it lifts all boats. Yeah, it's something. I think rising tide is part of the expression. Because if I remember right, that was the name of uh, Sky's little... Uh, yeah, her hacker unit hacker in the very beginning of that show. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Another thing that I found really interesting in this film was the soundtrack. I started talking about that earlier. I don't, I don't mean the soundtrack, sorry. Let's say the score so that we can keep it from being confused. The score to this movie, and as you would expect, it had a great deal of uh, African influences. And there was some really interesting stuff. One part that really stood out to me, do you know what the, the group of the female guards, what they were called? Well, I think that they're called the Dora Milaji. Does that sound right? Yeah, that does sound right. But it's something, you know, that I'd only ever seen in text. I didn't know how to say. (laughs) Right. Like Magneto. Yeah, well. (laughs) (laughs) Your reaction to that is even funnier than the actual thing. (laughs) How upset you feel that you didn't know that. Anyways, uh, (laughs) that group, like, and, and as happens in a lot of film scores... Certain people get themes, and when you see them doing stuff, then you hear their musical theme that goes along with them. And that's something that goes all the way back into like opera, long before even films existed. But uh, they had this really interesting... I don't know if you noticed it, it was, it was like a, almost like a whistling sound or something like that. There, it, when they were doing their little James Bond kind of exploit, and uh, they start fighting in that casino the woman who was the member of the Dora Milaje is that what you said? That's what I said. Her name's Okoye. Okay. Okoye she's she's up there fighting and it's kind of going around the room you know so you see Black Panther fighting and then the camera goes up to up there and you see her fighting with a bunch of people the the stuff comes in just right and it's like whoop whoop <laughs> I can't remember exactly how it went, unfortunately, I only saw it once, but oh, it just, it was almost otherworldly to hear that right in the middle of that and and see her fighting and it was just really, really neat. And I actually watched a little feature because I was just trying to look for that, the score, and I came across the composer's name, first of all, which was uh, Ludwig Goransson. Okay. He's apparently a Swedish composer, and I thought, gosh, do I know that guy's name? And I looked in my iTunes and searched for his name, and it didn't come up, and I just thought, why? 
and I finally realized he was the composer for Community. <laughs> the TV show Community? He, yeah, he did the TV show Community. I searched like on IMDb and I was looking at his film scores and he wasn't coming up with any movies that I liked. And I was just like, weird that I know his name. And then finally I came across Community. And so he did, and you recognize a lot of the songs that you hear on Community, because you would hear them uh, relatively often, you know, they would come up and, and their, their stuff. There was a point where one time at work I downloaded a whole bunch of songs from Community and I would just listen to them while I would work. And then I forgot about that, that they were there, and I never took them home. And, and then they had to, uh, like, re-image the computer that I usually worked on. And when they did that, that lost all those songs. So I don't have them anymore. That's why they didn't come up when I searched for them on iTunes. But I love the guy. I mean, the stuff from Community is great. So I already have an affinity for him. But there was a little feature on YouTube that you could watch where he talked about the process of doing the music for Black Panther. And he even goes through and he's talking about the talking drum, for example, is the, uh, the instrument that uh, is T'Challa's, uh, his theme. You know, whenever he's doing something, you'll start hearing the talking drum going. And he's got the talking drum actually saying like, T'Challa, T'Challa, you know, it, it makes more or less, you know, like the drum is saying its name. Not the, the talking drum doesn't talk. <laughs> Let me not confuse you. <laughs> but it, they call it that because you can uh, change the sounds that it works because apparently it's got like strings or something on the outside of it where you can tighten them and it'll change the sound. But anyways, I, uh, just that stuff and being able to recognize the themes from people, I'd really like to get my hands on the score. At this point, I was thinking it might even be neat because there's a great deal of scores from Marvel films that I have, but there's also a great deal of them that I do not have. And I thought it would be neat to go through and make like an album that just has like at least one, you know, representative song for each movie of the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe. Because at this point, there's lots. I mean, how many movies are there? So you could easily make a, a great big album out of something like that if you, you know, you get like the Macarena song for Iron Man and then you get the <laughs> Sons of Odin for Thor and, you know, Captain America theme and some of those, I. I've never even like checked out like the Ant-Man. I'm not sure that I know. Sadly, I own that movie. We own it. <laughs> I've never watched it. We got it because my daughter really wanted it and she's watched it. So at least it wasn't a waste of money, but I've never watched it. And I don't know why I should have. I really enjoyed the movie and I never watched it since to see if I, if it holds up, I guess, or whatever the, whatever I'm going for here. But yeah, seeing the trailer, which they had, for the sequel to Ant-Man. They had the trailer for that before Black Panther, which reminded me, I guess, of Ant-Man and made me think, man, I ought to check some of those things out. But yeah, I'm kind of a, a film score geek, but not really. I'm, I'm sure there's people that make me look like a complete novice, but I do really like bombastic, you know, action movie kind of scores, especially. And ones like this, where they have something different to them. Uh, I saw a movie back in the 90s called The Power of One. I don't know if you've ever heard of that one, but it was, what's his face? Shoot, what can I think of his name? Super famous. Zimmer, Hans Zimmer. Thank you, sorry. It was Hans Zimmer back when I, I, I think he was really starting out at this point uh, when this movie came out. And uh, this was a movie set in South Africa. And oh my gosh, the music on that movie was so amazing. I got the soundtrack back in the day when I had to buy the cassette tape to get the soundtrack. But yeah, there was some just amazing stuff in that soundtrack. And I, I, and I, I bet that that movie, having done The Power of One, is what got him the gig with Disney doing The Lion King. Ah. Because he's already had really good experience and he'd already produced some just amazing stuff. So yeah, he, he's done his share of that. And so we've got a few 
They're like that. I like that stuff. I like... <laughs> I guess the word for it is diversity. I like uh, all different kinds of things. I find it wonderful that there is so many different things out there and that we can experience them, you know? I don't want to take them from others, uh, but I do like to be able to experience them, to know what, what there is out there and to see that there's a big, beautiful world out there. There's so many different things, so many different peoples and places. That's, I guess, one of those things that this Black Panther movie reminds me of again. You know, it's, it's easy living in America to just get into your own little bubble, surround yourself with people that look like you and think like you and talk like you, and to force away those people that don't, uh, you know, to avoid them, to block them on Facebook so you don't have to deal with them, to just be stuck in that. And uh, I think that's not the way to go. I think it's important to experience everything and to hear everybody and to really, you know, see what's good and I guess bad about different people. And uh, I love when something like this comes along and you get that opportunity again. Well, there you go. That sounds like a good place to end, man. <laughs> Do you agree? I guess. I don't know. I feel like I don't have... I never feel like I have something worthwhile enough to say to say that we should end on something that I said. Oh. <laughs> but that's probably just me and my lack of uh, confidence, my lack of uh, whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's end on that. Sounds good. Well, good, good. Okay, so thank you uh, for hooking up with me and uh, going to see the movie so that we could talk about it. I know that's the only reason you saw it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, whoever is out there listening, thank you for listening. Yeah. Wish we could do more of these. Yeah, we'll have to, we'll have to see. Rish has, what is it called, Movie Pass? I do. Yeah, he has Movie Pass this year, so he's seeing every friggin' movie that he possibly has any interest in. It's almost like he's in film school again. <laughs> so, if there's a movie you think we should talk about, uh, let us know, because Rish is going to see it. You know, if you think it's worthwhile, then I guess I could go out and see it too. And I don't get out to nearly as many movies, but, you know, I'll do my homework sometime. Well, see, yeah, the thing with movie Pass is it seems to be made for p lonely people like me. <laughs> okay. Who are used to saying, one, please. <laughs> I, I, I mean, if, if you and your best friend or you and your girlfriend both had movie Pass or whatever, you could go and you get your tickets at the same time and make sure that you sit together and all that, I, I think it would be great. But uh, in my experience, it's been great for, oh, something's about to start in 10 minutes. I could just jet over there and I could see it for free, essentially. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'll, I think I'm going to go do that. But at, at the same time, I went to my uh, the writer's conference that I go to every year and... There were people, these people that are real writers that are out there publishing things and selling and have deadlines and contracts and are making their dreams come true. And something that they'd say over and over again is, I don't watch TV. I don't play video games. I can't tell you the last time I got out and saw a movie because, you know, if you're going to be a writer, that's what you do. Right. You write instead of these other things. And the whole time I'm thinking, oh, I got movie pass so I could go see everything that I wanted to. Yeah, well, you know, you can do that sometimes, you know what I mean? It doesn't have to be like, you know, you want to take a year and do something. Call it a sabbatical. <laughs> doesn't mean you have to stop being a writer. And you still have the rest of the day and the rest of the week. You know, I doubt you see, what, more than four or five a week tops. <laughs> So, you know, that's, what, 10 hours out of 168 hours in a week. Granted, like half of those are spent sleeping, but you know, you got, you got still time to write if you want to. As you said, you're, you're one of those lonely guys that's used to saying one please. So it's not like, you know, you're, you're out, you know, hanging out with your friend Big Anklevich or something. Not anymore, no. 
I think you could still you can still manage. Yeah, I, I actually feel the same way all the time. I have a hard I have a hard time with the guilt that I feel when I'm watching a movie instead of writing. Or especially like right now I just discovered that The Expanse, which is based on those James S. A. Corey books that I think I've talked about several times, but I haven't been able to see any of the TV show uh, based on it. That is now available on Amazon Prime, which I have, so I can watch the first season of it. And I just saw that and I thought, oh, and then I looked and saw there's like 10 episodes. So it's like 10 hours that I'd have to devote to that. I really want to, but that's 10 hours that I'm not putting into other things, especially writing, which is something that I really need to get back to. It's been, it was, it was February. Uh, last year when I started up writing every single day at least 500 words in February is what I did last year and then that expanded to a thousand words in March I think it remained a thousand words in April and then I made it halfway through May before the craziness of moving out of the state kind of threw me off of my game and I've never gotten back on my game so being off my game makes me feel all the more guilty even considering going and watching 10 hours of a TV show. But I really want to. Yes, but you can reward yourself if you do start writing again, if you do the things that you're supposed to do by having The Expanse out there as a carrot. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. You know, you've been talking about dieting when we're not on the air. And you reward yourself if you honor your diet by buying a book. And it just seems like, okay, well, an extension of that can be you can reward yourself by, you know, every X number of days you write in a row, you can reward yourself with an episode of The Expanse. Yeah, that's a good idea. And then you needn't feel guilty. In fact, you can feel pride, double pride, that you earned it. And then, hey, (laughs) I'm also really enjoying this show. Yeah, that's a really good idea. I think I may have to do that. And plus, when you get on the horse and decide that you're going to start riding, I feel the pressure myself. And I often say, oh, gosh, well, if he can do it, I can do it too. And I need that right now. So You you live by that song. Anything you can do, I can do better. Well, that has been the case, yes. (laughs) I can do anything better than you. So, uh... No, you can't. Let's end on that horrible note. (laughs) All right. Well, it's it's a perfect way to send everybody off wanting to never come back. Excellent. Thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, And we'll see you next time. I've been Big Yankovich. And I have been White Outfield. Whoa. Good night. All right. See you, folks. That Gets My Black Panther is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 no derivatives license. So, unlike the secrets of Wakanda, you are permitted to share it with all around you, but you must do so for free and can make no petty claims on it. Big and rich, they never please. So, you know, that's what, 10 hours out of 100 and... I don't know, how many hours are in a week? Well, isn't it 24 times 7? Yeah, but do you know that? Hold on one sec. Siri, how many hours are in a week? Okay, it's 168. So there. I would not have been able to just work that out in my head as fast as I could type out how many hours are in a week. So (laughs) I went that direction.